Welcome, everyone. It's always really good to see everybody logging in from all over the world. Very exciting. And today we are starting a new series with Dr. McDougall. It's called McDougall's Medicine. And every week, Dr. McDougall will choose a chapter from this great book that he wrote several years ago. Today, he is talking about cancer. And um, every one of you have gotten your homework. So hopefully, you were able to print or at least read the newsletters and the chapter from the book. It's all free provided to you in, in several of the emails that you get with the link to log in. Uh, and that's just so for that you can uh, get the most out of these webinars. And a lot of the questions will probably most likely be answered in those uh, in that reading. So we're excited to have Dr. McDougall today. And without further ado, how are you, Dr. McDougall? Doing no fine? Oh, I'm good. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm looking forward to tomorrow. You know, yes. We have the advanced study weekend. And hopefully, um, many of you will be attending live in Santa Rosa, California, if you're not. You can always watch on the internet almost live. It's like delayed for 20 minutes. And it's going to be exciting. We have uh, many great guests. And uh, we also are introducing the new doctors of the 21st century, which include uh, Matt Letterman, Alona Pauldi, uh, Anthony Lim, Craig McDougall, and Tom Campbell. So you're going to meet who's going to carry on after these old bones quit. <laughs> You know, uh, and that which brings me to what I want to do over the next maybe probably eight weeks is uh, I had the good fortune to be passionate about the scientific literature since I've been, uh, since my uh, residency. It happened, it happened in my residency after my experience as a plantation doctor. I discovered uh, the science, the uh, Hawaii Medical Library was on the grounds of the Queens Medical Center. And so when I was a resident studying to be a board certified internist, I spent every free moment in the medical library. Now at that time we had Medicus Index, we didn't have the internet. I would uh, go through the stacks, I would uh, take journals, put them in a cardboard box, drag them on a hand with a hand cart over to the hospital where I could copy them. And I did that for almost two and a half years and have stopped, not stopped the passion I have for the scientific research that was in 1978. Finally, I wrote my first book, The Plan. I believe it was in 83 or 84. And then I wrote this book, uh, which you showed a cover up, which is called McDougall's Medicine, A Challenging Second Opinion. And I wrote that when I was 38 years old. I'm 69 and a half now. So that was a long time ago. I mean, that was uh, 1985. So we're looking at you know, 32 years ago, I wrote this book. But I have to say, I, I read the chapter and I'll read each chapter before we get together over the next few weeks. And I would like you to read the chapters too. And I read the chapters and I found uh, some amplification that I would offer, but really no change. And anybody who's gonna study the issues of cancer, atherosclerosis, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, kidney disease, you need to know this material first, because this is the basis of the scientific research. It's all been, uh, all been uh, amplified over the years, over the last 32 years, but not changed. And you'll be amazed at uh, what I discovered back then. And uh, I don't mean to brag that the clarity of thinking that I had and the ability to write and put these things down as a young man at 38 years old. But I guess that's when most people are, mo are, are most productive in their life during that time when they're in their 20s and 30s. And so I was, and you know, since then I've, I've tried to try to uh, keep up with the scientific research and to inform you about what's going on. But I have to say, ladies and gentlemen, there's very, very, very little that I have to change since then. So what I wanna do is uh, if we can get the slide presentation to work okay, I'll go through some slides on that chapter and then some additional things. And then uh, after maybe 10, 15 minutes of discussing this chapter with you, and I rely upon you to do the real serious study. I can't go through all of what I put together. It took me, it took me almost six years to write this book. I can't put all of that together in just a few minutes I get to uh, talk to you, but I, I hope that I can at least uh, open your eyes and stimulate your interest, particularly those of you who are our patients, those of you who are medical doctors or scientists who want to understand the, the basic research uh, that went on in after I'm done with this, uh, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to talk about the 
article that just came out a couple of um, a few days ago. It was on uh, the crooked behavior, the dishonest behavior of industry, and it was published in JAMA Internal Medicine. It hit national headlines, and a lot of you are writing about it. So I want to spend a, just a few minutes discussing that article also as we get along in the presentation. But let me see if I can uh, <clears throat> I can get this uh, to work for us and see if we can get a little screen share going on. And uh, what do you know? Do we? Uh, yeah, we're, no, we just have to, have to give me a, one more minute. All right, that's good. Go. I have to go back and get it set up here. Technology. You know, uh, Dr. McDougall over there, um, uh, yes. where you do all the, your events, it's a, a lot of people know it, but some don't. It's a wonderful resort called the Flamingo. Yes, and, it is. Uh, and while you're looking doing that, I'm just going to show oh, something. I, I, I got it right here. You go ahead. You almost have. It's, 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 uh, it's just. Just something. Is oh. the cover of the book show? Let's see. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Okay. Well, great. Yeah. So you're going to be yeah, you're going to be at the resort tomorrow. We'll get a chance to get together. But this is the cover of the book. I remember I published it in 1985, and uh, I was 38 years old. So that was um, <clears throat> almost 32 years ago. And uh, if you look through that chapter on cancer, you're going to find uh, some very interesting things. Uh, to start off, the book uh, makes a quote that uh, is 600 years old, more than 600 years old. Other people have uh, have provided this quote as an original quote, but uh, never this timely in terms of uh, being this old. Uh, Montaigne, I think, is the originator of this, even though other people have claimed originality. What Montaigne says about a new idea is this, this Whenever a new discovery is reported in the scientific world, they say, first, it's probably not true. And of course, that's what it was uh, back in the 1970s and 80s when it came to diet and disease and the ineffectiveness of uh, heart surgery, uh, colon cancer surgery, breast cancer surgery, diabetes surgery. Uh, these became new ideas, but uh, they said they weren't true. It couldn't possibly be true that food had anything to do with disease or you know, 80% of the treatments that we offer patients are really doing them far more harm than good. And uh, then Montaigne says, uh, thereafter, when the truth of the new proposition has been demonstrated beyond question, they say, yes, it may be true, but it's not important. And that's where we are today in terms of diet, for example. They say, sure, diet's important. People are confused as to whether they should an all meat diet or a paleo diet or the kind of diet I recommend, but they all agree it's important. And then they say, uh, or it's true, but then they say it's not important because there's so much disagreement about what is the right diet. That's where we're at today. And they say, well, even if it's true, it's not important because nobody will follow a healthy diet. So that's where we are now. And if we survive long enough as a civilization, as a species, as a planet, then the next phase of the argument, as Montaigne says, is finally, when sufficient time has elapsed to fully evidence its importance, they say, yes, surely it is important, but it's no longer new. I mean, we've known this all along. And uh, that's the way hopefully it'll be is that Harvard and Yale and the American Medical Association, the American Cancer Society and so on will say, well, yeah, it's true and it's important and we discovered it. I don't really care. You know, I don't care who lays uh, claim to the discovery. Anyway, uh, in this chapter, I talked to you about the importance of estrogen in terms of breast cancer development. And uh, what you see here is the estrogen levels in women based upon what they eat. You see the estrogen levels, uh, which is the top uh, bar, the top uh, line. The estrogen levels are quite high in women who eat the American diet. The reason they're high is some of the foods contain estrogens, like the animal foods are injected with estrogens. The other thing is that uh, animal fat is converted in the intestine into estrogen-like materials. And plant foods actually block the absorption of estrogens from the guts. So when you have a low plant food diet, you have more estrogen in your body. And the other thing is, is fat, body fat makes estrogen. It turns androgens made in your adrenal glands into estrogen. 
So estrogen promotes cancer growth, particularly breast cancer growth. It promotes other diseases in women, fibrocystic breast disease, uh, ovarian disease, uterine, uterine cancer, fibroids of the uterus are all promoted by elevated estrogen levels. And so is early, early menstruation, early onset of menstruation. Back then when I wrote this book, uh, the onset of the first menstrual period in a little girl on the American diet was 12. It should be 16. At 16, you're supposed to be getting interest in family, sexual interests, desires and functions. That's when you're supposed to be starting to have a family. But even back then in 1985, the onset was 12 because of the American diet. It is as early as, um, well, it depends on how you measure it, menstrual period, 10 or 11 years old uh, in women, uh, young girls on the American diet. If you use a uh, breast bud development and uh, the onset, the development of pubic hair, you find 3% of black girls at age three are going through puberty. And at age, age eight, half of the black girls in this country are developing breast buds and pubic hair. This is a, this is a, a criminal assault on our society and our families. And then you see the other end of life at menopause, uh, women on the Western diet menopause at age 60. Normal menopause or stopping your periods is around 46 to 48. So you develop these high estrogen levels on the Western diet, which promote disease like breast cancer, other breast diseases, uterine disease, and so on. That's in the book. You need to know that. Now, what do I believe today? I believe that to be true. I would add more emphasis today on estrogenic uh, compounds that are environmental contaminants and also environmental contaminants, in other words, chemical pollutants made by industry that initiate and promote cancer. But you see, these only started since World War II as far as a big impact on the environment. But uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, development of breast cancer is uh, from ancient times. They, provoke, uh, they uh, describe breast cancer and the literature, you know, written literature of people hundreds of years ago. And of course, it occurred in many women in the early 1900s. So it's not a disease just based on these chemicals. It's a disease based on obesity and resulting estrogen productions. All right. In this chapter, I talk to you about treatment. And as you probably know, I recommend a lumpectomy as the treatment for almost all women. That's it. That means removal of the tumor and uh, surrounding disease. In other words, you need to have clear margins. But you have a choice when it comes to treating breast cancer. You can have a biopsy, nothing else, a lumpectomy, partial mastectomy, where they move, remove a segment of the breast, say quarter of the breast, a simple mastectomy, where they remove the entire breast, modified radical, which removes the breast and lymph nodes, a radical mastectomy, which includes removal of the breast lymph nodes underlying chest muscles, and uh, extended radical mastectomy. Actually, uh, at the turn of the century, at the beginning of the 1900s, they were treating women with breast cancer with not only a extended radical mastectomy, but they would actually take the arm on the affected side of the woman's body. Oh, that's radical. The important thing to know is it makes no difference how extensive a surgery you do in terms of survival. And this is a very deadly disease. It doesn't uh, uh, really reflect today the statistics published by a friend of mine. And actually, I did a show with him on McDougal's Medicine and McDougal's Medicine, which is a TV show I had for many years. I had C. Barbara Mueller on as a guest, and that's a show I have access to and may someday show you that show. But he was head of the Department of Surgery at McMaster's University, and he did one of the studies on uh, the ultimate outcome of women with breast cancer, who get, get, get breast cancer. He studied them over 35 years. And what he found is that uh, nothing matters in terms of treatment, a stage of disease, growth. Nothing seems to matter as far as determining the time of death or all of the 90% certainty that death will be due to cancer of the breast. I know that's really depressing. I uh, quote uh, two other studies, at least in that chapter, which show you that uh, women who get breast cancer, I mean, really breast cancer. Today, many women are being diagnosed with 
something that's not breast cancer. It's called ductal carcinoma in situ. But these are women who really, really had invasive breast cancer. The studies show 70 to 90% of women who get it ultimately die of it with active disease. Uh, that's important to know when you're choosing therapy, why choose breast amputation or cutting the muscles off on your left side or you know, doing these radical surgeries when it's not gonna make any difference. And that's true today as it was before. So why does it not make any difference? This is a, uh, a uh, uh, chart, a, a picture that I presented in many different forms in my writings over many years. But this is the original one that I did. And you see the women going from a big smile to a big frown. And you see the development of breast cancer, how it occurs and how it doubles. What it explains to you that, is that breast cancer occurs in a breast that contains 100 billion cells per breast. One cell switches over to being a cancerous cell. It's always one cell that leads the way. And it starts doubling. And its average doubling time is every 100 days. So at the end of a year, which you see there at the bottom on the X uh, line of the graph, at the end of the year, you have 12 cancer cells in a breast. The doubling continues, and you see when you finally get out to about uh, six years, you have a tumor mass that's one millimeter in size. That's the size of a lead tip of a pencil of a period on a paper. It's undetectable, yet you've had cancer for six years. You can't detect it by any means available. The divisions continue. And finally, at 10 years on average, the tumor becomes detectable. It's a centimeter in size. It contains a billion cells. And it's finally detectable. So that's when you go to the doctor for treatment. You go to the doctor with late stage disease, always. And you expect to catch it in time. Impossible. If you understand the natural history of this disease, which I wrote about in 1985, and it has been Un, it has been understood and known since the 1950s. And every knowledgeable doctor today knows this natural history. Now, there's a lot of lying that goes on. In fact, it's almost universal. When a woman with breast cancer goes to a doctor, an oncologist, a general surgeon, they're never told this truth. And I'll get to that in a couple of minutes. But uh, I knew this back in 1985, and I was actually involved in a law on informed consent, which was uh, passed in 1982 in Hawaii. There have been three laws passed that in states, Massachusetts, California, Hawaii, back in 1982, that by law forced physicians to tell women this truth. And now at least 19 states have these laws, but no doctors follow it. They essentially lie to their patients. The patient comes in and says, well, we have to get this. We have to catch it in time. Not only do we have to take the lump out, but we have to radiate your breast extensively, which by the way, I believe does not benefit the patient radiation. You can find uh, flimsy evidence to the contrary, but it's all biased, makes no sense. So they tell you you have to have a total mastectomy or a lumpectomy plus radiation. You have to have your nodes at least one of them, if not all of them removed. Then you have to go through anti-estrogen therapy, which by the way, does make sense based on what I showed you in the last slide. And then they provide you with chemotherapy by the way, which I believe to be chemical castration. In other words, when chemotherapy works, it's because it destroys the woman's ovaries. And that's what the research says. You can read about that, not only in this book, but in my women's book, which I published several years later, which has uh, references on breast cancer. So therapies don't work. Doctors continue to lie at even a greater rate than they, well, no, not a greater rate. About the same. In fact, when I was in Hawaii, when I had to testify against, by the way, essentially all the physicians in Hawaii, those from University of Hawaii, from the Hawaii Can uh, Cancer Society, when I had to testify, the uh, doctors told me that they were doing a good job and they were informing women and I said, well, then that's the reason 90% of women in our state have mastectomies. And the 10% that don't, most of them are too sick to undergo the procedure. And you say you're informing women. Anyway, we could go into that. Uh, there's a big discussion of that particular chapter of my life. In the women's book, it tells you about the fight that I had 
to get the third informed consent law passed in the state of Hawaii in the women's book, the McDougal, uh, the McDougal program for women. Okay, so these treatments that we give women back then and today, they depress the immune system and we know this and the science is clear. You're trying to fight this tumor, your body is. You've got a host versus tumor battle that's going on. And you're giving therapies that don't catch the disease in time. They can't possibly do it. And they work only, only because they destroy the ovaries. They don't go out and catch those cells that uh, run all over the place. And when I say only, you know, you can argue with me about some minor percentages. Okay, big deal. What I'm telling you is generally true. So major surgery depresses the immune system. Blood transfusions depress the immune system. We learned this because people with kidney transplants who got blood transfusions uh, kept their transplanted kidney longer as the blood transfusions suppress their immune system. Radiation, chemotherapy suppress the immune system. Removing or irradiating the lymph nodes suppress the immune system. So does a high fat diet. All this I told you back in 1985. There's a summary at the end that we could go through all of the issues, uh, but I put a nice summary at the end of the chapter talking about uh, the importance of diet and therapy in terms of preventing breast cancer and also what you do what after the development of breast cancer. And I say I had had very little to change in my thinking in 32 years, but you have to understand a lot has happened in 32 years. On the one side, industry has become more powerful and more effective in delivering their dishonest messages. And your hospitals are the biggest, fanciest buildings in town. You know, they're winning because they have the money. On the other side, there have been some honest people who've come up and tried to tell you the truth. Like the US Preventative Services Task Force, the Canadian Preventative uh, Services Task Force, the Cochrane Collaboration, they've tried to to come up against these uh, big businesses to offer the consumer an opportunity. So that's happened. Uh, it's given me a, a lot of uh, confidence in what I've tried to teach you. For example, the Cochrane Collaboration headed by uh, my friend, Peter Gertzky, who actually spoke at one of our weekends. He's the head of the Cochrane Collaboration, good man. The Cochrane Collaboration, which is the most uh, respected organization in the world in terms of unbiased information, came out in 2012 uh, with a brochure that was in 13 languages that told women to stop getting mammography. You can read the details of that on my website. I recommend against mammography for screening. Uh, the other thing that happened of great importance, uh, <clears throat> which I've told you about, it's in my February 2015 newsletter, was the American Cancer Society now recommends that people with cancer eat a diet in the direction that I recommend because it will prolong your survival. Don't you think that's pretty dramatic? Uh, again, it's something, and not to brag, but just to bring you into reality, something I was recommending in the very late 1970s and published for you before 1985. And 30 years later, the American Cancer Society comes out and tells you to stop the diet that causes cancer. In other words, stop throwing fuel on the fire. Well, that's happening, that's important. Uh, unfortunately, these are the statistics today. There was a uh, big move in the 1980s to have women stop doing mutilating surgery like mastectomies, but business has taken over and the trend has gone up again for mastectomies. These are some of the current statistics. 36% uh, of women had mastectomies compared to 64% that had lumpectomies. That should be like almost none have mastectomies except for those with very advanced and large tumors that you can't remove the obvious disease by doing a lumpectomy. Why is it increasing mastectomies? Why is it still popular? Why is this nonsense still going on? I don't even have to answer that question for you. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what the issues are. All you can do is protect yourself. I wrote uh, the book for you in 1985. I've continued to write new newsletter articles to bring you up to date on what the science says. I've tried to inform you about uh, others that have come along 
with the honesty and tried to help you, but you're not going to beat them. They have all the money. Uh, you can learn this. Uh, you, those of you who are professionals can read what I've written, both in the past and currently. You're welcome to challenge me at any step of the way. Now, my answers haven't been perfect, but they've been 99% 30 years ago compared to what I say right now. And that's because the truth doesn't change. But as Montaigne says, it's a long development from uh, realization to implementation. So anyway, uh, did we get any any questions on that, Gustavo? <clears throat> yes, there, there are some questions here, and I think that one of them pertains to uh, your book. It says, in the 1985 medicine book, Dr. McDougall indicates the estrogen hormones in meat and dairy are unlikely sources of increased estrogen. Other dogs, such as Pam uh, Pooper, say dairy is highly responsible for raised estrogen levels what which is true well both i mean meat and dairy yep. but dairy has a special quality to it and that is that uh they they milk dairy cows when they're pregnant so uh it, back in the old days you know you had a cow in the in the back field and you'd go out and milk her once a day and get a liter of milk a quart of milk out of her and when bessie got pregnant you gave her a break but these days, they get 24 liters of milk out of a single cow every day. And when she gets pregnant, too bad. And when she's pregnant, her hormone levels increase dramatically in her body and her milk. Uh, I would say, and my memory is probably full day on this, but I would say a 40-fold increase. You can correct me on that. Mm -hmm. So when you're consuming cow's milk off the shelf, you're consuming milk from pregnant cows, which is very high in the uh, hormones of pregnancy, which include estrogens. So yeah, Pam Popper's right. Pam Popper has been a friend of mine. Uh, she will tell you, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm always happy to hear this, is that uh, I, I initiated her, I, I opened her eyes. Let's just put it that way. Pam has done phenomenal work over the past 30 years. We've been very good friends. And I've had her at the Advanced Study Weekend. You listen to Pam Popper. Right. Uh, she'll give you the truth. Uh, Dr. McDougall, the, the, so the book, uh, uh, McDougal Medicine in 1985. That's still up to date, pretty much. Would you? Oh, yeah, I, I would. I just read through the chapter uh, in the last uh, hour, and I would think of nothing I would change, uh, mm -hmm. except, except uh, I feel more strongly against ma uh, mammography than I did back then. But you know, all I had was that was the literature available, and the and the the lies right. were huge. Uh, when I was a medical student, uh, Dr. Wolf, who discovered mammograms. Uh, his um, technique uh, came in the know, in, in, into knowing uh, Dr. Wolf. And so that was, when I was a medical student, that was uh, 1968 to 1972. And I can remember standing in a doctor's office, uh, uh, an x-ray, a radiologist's office, looking at the first mammograms and then kind of shaking their head and saying, boy, this is really crude. Well, this is really, really a crude technique, ladies and gentlemen. But it makes mm -hmm. uh, billions of dollars every year, not just from the testing, but from the testing and treatments that follow. Uh, this is the ultimate in disease mongering. You go out and you take a whole bunch of healthy people, tens of millions of healthy women, and you bring them into the business by telling them they must have a mammogram. And uh, unfortunately, uh, many of them fail the test. They don't right. have breast cancer, but then they're in the business. This is one of the, when history is written, if we have a history, one of the greatest crimes in medicine will be the breast cancer business and mammography. Mm -hmm. That'll be written by historians as, a, as the, the greatest harm that's ever been, doing to, been done to human beings, and especially women. And uh, this isn't the same as is with breast, with prostate cancer. And I write about this in the medicine chapter. I just read it. In the uh, McDougall's medicine chapter on breast cancer, at the, towards the end, I talked to you about gender bias, sexism. Uh, mammograms and uh, breast self-examination, et cetera, are, um, have been heavily recommended to women since the uh, early 1980s, whereas PSA testing has been uh, universally explained to men as being ineffective and harmful. Now, the only people who don't give that explanation are those in the business. But otherwise, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, the Cochrane Collaboration, 
the Canadian Preventative Services Task Force, every single organization says PSA is going to do you more harm than good. And by the way, this is a joke I probably shouldn't make, <laughs> but uh, we've been recommending uh, breast self-examination for 40 or 50 years. I refuse to recommend breast self-examination until we remove, we remove gender bias. And we start recommending prostate self-examination for men. Okay, oh, well, that was fair. a nasty one. That was a nasty one. But you, you see the gender <laughs> bias in this. I mean, it's the same disease, breast it's cancer true. in women. It's the same disease as prostate cancer in men. Oh, I could go on and on. But then we turn this <laughs> in a dirty show. <laughs> <laughs> but Dr. Uh, Dr. Magtugal, the, the, the um, newsletters that that uh, we shared that, that you wanted people to read in the book, they have links to studies that people can print and take to their doctor's office if needed, right? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I encourage people to take my work. You know, my work, uh, the, the, the McDougal Program for Women and McDougal's Medicine, I, I own them. Okay, no publisher owns them anymore. And they're available on my website. There's a small download fee for the PDF files, or you can get them in a used bookstore for 50 cents. I, I encourage you when you're dealing with heart disease, even though these books are 20 and 30 years old, to copy the chapters. Go to your doctor and say, look, this is what Dr. McDougal wrote. Take my newsletter, say the same thing. The doctor is going to brush you off and say, rightly so, I don't have time to do this. And you say, well, look, doctor, you know, you're, you're talking about procedures that could cost me $30,000, $130,000 if I didn't have insurance, mm -hmm. $200,000, quarter million dollars. Uh, I'll tell you what, Doc, what's your time worth an hour? What, what, what do you make an hour? Uh, would you consider $300 an hour, $500 an hour? I mean, you can even pocket this tax-free if you want. Not just kidding. <laughs> but I'm going to pay you for your time. And I want you to sit down and read these chapters or these newsletters. And I want you to sit down with me in a week. And I want to discuss these. And I want you to show me why Dr. McDougall is incorrect. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I promise you, except for a slight emphasis of bias, you will not find a single thing that I've written to be incorrect. Why? What's well, my passion? You know, it's right. like if you're a professional golfer or a an Olympic swimmer, whatever you do, this is what I've spent my whole life doing. This is not a game for me. And uh, you can ask Mary, you know, if, uh, if she says, what, what took John away from the family? For our 45 years of marriage, she'd say his passion about science, about reading the literature. He says, and she, goes, she comes in the room, in, in our, our TV room, she, there's this big stack of journals, even to today, I've tried to minimize it with the internet. And she said, well, you get these out of the... <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a constant argument. It has been for 45 years with this to this stack of journals that I have on my desk. And now it's like, you know, would you stop for a minute and say hello to me, John, and eat your breakfast and stop reading yes. the Internet? It's just a passion. That's what happens when it's a passion. Yeah. Yes. That's what happens. So uh, it challenged me. And I, I've told you many times you can bring guests on the webinar. Uh, Gustavo will bring them in as a, mm -hmm. a challenge. It's no problem. You can send a... Uh, you can send emails to Gustavo. Uh, he will read them, particularly the ones that are challenging. Uh, I love challenge. Uh, this I feed on it. Mm -hmm. I feed on. I, I feed on getting, <laughs> getting passion out of you. Open your eyes. If I can't do it with statements as dramatic as I have, what can I do? I know a lot of you have been very much woken up. Right. And understand. Dr. McDougall, can you just briefly comment about the cancer of a uterus and if surgery, when is your surgery uh, needed or if it's reversible with diet or? Well, we're talking about two kinds of cancer. One is the cervix, mm -hmm. which is uh, caused by a uh, by sexual relations. It's a venereal disease. Uh, it's by a virus. It's a ward virus that uh, infects the cervix. And so there are vaccines for that, which by the way, my children will be getting. And uh, I know you think that's whatever. But uh, my grandchildren will be getting these vaccines. Uh, and uh, they're caused, caused by a virus. Uh, this is not a dietary disease. 
And then there are cancers of the body, the uterus, the endometrium. And uh, those are caused by diet, similar to breast cancer. They're adenocarcinomas. And uh, they're deadly also. <clears throat> but most of what's diagnosed is uh, cancer of the uterus, really isn't cancer of the uterus. And never threatens a woman li woman's life, just like breast cancer. You know, 40% of women in their 40s have uh, various stages of breast cancer. Likewise, it's a very common cancer in women in their 40s. But uh, almost never, almost never, very rarely does it turn into a life-threatening disease. I wrote a uh, letter, a newsletter, which is very, very fascinating. It's about abusive physicians. And I have a patient for many years who has had uterine cancer. And I have had dealings with two of their uh, gynecologic surgeons about whether or not she should have her uterus removed. She didn't want to have her uterus removed. This has been going on for over 20 years. And by the way, I, I've seen her as recently as uh, a few months ago. She's alive and healthy and well. And uh, so I've discussed with each of these surgeons, personally discussed with them on the phone and by email. And I've asked them for evidence that uh, removal of the uterus and hysterectomy will prolong their life. And neither of them could provide any evidence there, and there is no evidence that hysterectomy will prolong the life of a woman with uterine cancer. Now, the last one, uh, which is about abusive physicians, and you go to my website, you look under hot topics and uh, common cancers, and uh, there's an article about a lady, I call her, a doctor, I call her Dr. Hopeful, Hopeful, mm -hmm. who tried to defend my patient, we'll call her Mary, that's not her real name. I called her something else in the newsletter, but I forget. Tried to uh, talk her into having a hysterectomy, and uh, I told her uh, that she can have a hysterectomy only, I mean, with my blessings. You can have a hysterectomy whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. But with my blessings, she could have a hysterectomy only if the doctor could provide me a single study that shows well, we've been doing this, uh, this, these hysterectomies for 50 years on millions of women. You show me a single study that shows that taking out the uterus prolongs life. So anyways, this led to a phone conversation and the doctor, Dr. Hopeful, used language that would only be used by a drunken sailor outside of a tavern. She swore at me. I tell you, she swore at me for 15 minutes before I had a chance to get back to her. And I said to her, I said, okay, that's fine. I understand your interests are in helping the patient, but you need to provide me as the patient's advocate. I'm the patient's general doctor. So the job of the general doctor is to serve as an advocate for the patient, to protect the patient from unnecessary treatment and aggressive specialists. That's your job as an internist, a family practitioner, as a generalist. That's what you're hired for in part. Do your job. So anyway, I asked the, the, the Dr. Hopeful, who's a specialist in gynecologic oncology in Michigan, I asked her to provide for me a single study. She could not do it. Now, she threatened to turn me into the medical board, uh, into my licensing board, et cetera, for not recommending a hysterectomy to that patient. When I got done with her, I told her I was going to turn her into the Michigan uh, medical board, her licensing board, her specialty board, for her treating patients aggressively with no evidence to the benefit. And I would have done it, except for the fact that I consulted with my patient. Let's call her Mary. I call her something else in the newsletter, and her real name is something else. And she said she asked me not to do it because she didn't want to be known in the community among doctors in her community as a patient that uh, probably caused this doctor to lose her license, which should have been done. So I didn't do it. But the newsletter is still there. And uh, you know, all you have to do, you're the consumer, is just ask the doctor for evidence that this is going to do you more harm than good and share what I've shared. There are differences of opinion, but you're the customer and you're going to ultimately benefit or be harmed most by the decisions being made. Exactly. I just said uh, doctors are not used to having a patient ask them for evidence. It's like, are you asking me? I know everything. Who, where did you go to medical school, ma'am? <laughs> You know, the reason right. is it's it's the emperor has no clothes. That's the problem is because doctors, cardiologists in particular, oncologists, diabetologists, et cetera, they know the evidence shows that what they do is harmful. And so to deal with a questioning patient is you beat them. You, you knock them down. 
so they don't ask questions. Don't you dare ask me this. Who's the doctor? Right. Who are you. And that's how the uh, people who are uh, threatened and who uh, are in the wrong in any business, that's how they deal with the adversary. Mm -hmm. is you, you, you may be belittle them. The emperor has no clothes. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. Uh, Dr. Bartolo, can you just expand a little bit because there are a few people asking why you are recommending the HPV vaccination? Because I think it works. And my, my grandchildren, no matter how much their parents think they won't be sexually active, will be. And I know this is caused by a virus. And as you know, I recommend immunizations for all of my children and grandchildren for everything, pretty much everything. And I say everything, probably not everything but everything except the flu. Uh, I do not recommend flu vaccines and uh, you'll see a, a whole newsletter I wrote on that. And the reason is, is because the genetic uh, strain of flu changes every year. Whereas the genetic strains for pneumonia, for HPV, uh, for smallpox, which I wish I could mm -hmm. get a vaccine for, right. uh, you know, for mumps, measles, hepatitis A, B, and so on. The genetic strains are stable. And so you can make an effective vaccine against these things. Whereas the flu, we make vaccines against what the virus was last year or three years ago. So that's why the flu vaccine does not work. I mean, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, two to three weeks ago, maybe last week, it was in the front page of every newspaper that those of you who gave your children the flu mist, the uh, inhalation vaccine, it is totally ineffective. And you must go and get your children shots for the flu. <laughs> it was just in the newspaper, national headlines. Well, they're admitting that the flu mist doesn't work. Well, I'll tell you that the flu shots don't work either. Mm -hmm. And I've reviewed that whole science for you in a newsletter. But this is a multi, multi-billion dollar a year business. And if you want to read the evidence, you'll see how, what flimsy ground they stand on. So how do you prevent yourself from getting the flu? Well, you stay indoors. Don't go out in public. <laughs> wash your hands. I don't know. I mean, I get the flu. Right. You know, it's been a major thing in my life and Mary's life and probably all of yours. It's a, a very difficult uh, infection, but uh, you don't solve the problem by giving ineffective vaccines. So why do I, why am I going to give my grandsons and my one granddaughter or recommended I, their parents have to decide to take HPV because HPV is real. And it infects and uh, likely your children will have uh, multiple sexual partners, as most people do. And uh, likely they'll be exposed to HPV, and uh, this is a preventable cancer with the vaccine. Don't throw the baby out with the wash water. Right. When when you when people have to get a um, flu vaccine because of their type of work that they do, someone is saying, is the uh, preservative free vaccine better? Or well, you, you can. Get, and again, you're asking me to recall things that I haven't written about for a couple of years. But as I remember, single dose. Uh, flu shots do not contain the preservatives. Whereas mm -hmm. when they come from a multi-dose vial, they right. do contain preservatives. Now you can check that and see whether or not I'm correct. Okay. I believe all of them contain aluminum. Uh, I forget the methyl, the, uh, the methyl, uh, the mercury, methyl mercury, probably methyl mercury, five year or so, five, and regardless. Right. Uh, there's a right. mercury substance in the, in the vac many vaccines. <clears throat> and you could go back and read my newsletter to get correct information on that. But that that's uh, all I recall from what I wrote, wrote a couple of years ago. But I do know right. for sure, I do know for sure I will not be getting the flu vaccine, nor will I be recommending it to any of my patients or any of my family members this year or next or the past, unless some miraculous discovery comes out where they can match the strain with the vaccine. All right. Can you just mention... Maybe I say, it's amazing where we go in these webinars, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Oh, okay, Dr. Montego, one thing before, because someone is uh, asking here, if you could just talk about diet and breast cancer, um, maybe for the last five minutes or whatever we have left. Well, are we, we're going to have a chance to uh, go over this uh, sugar thing, hopefully. Uh, okay. The diet, yeah, the diet that causes breast cancer, uh, and I go through this in great detail in the lecture that you can find on my website, you look under education, videos, and uh, 
there are expert expert videos and uh, there's one I did on diet and cancer that you can get it. They'll show you the uh, epidemiologic data, the uh, research data and so on. And you can also read this in my February 2015 newsletter. But uh, it basically kind of comes down to the Western diet, which is high fat, high cholesterol, uh, low in uh, phytoestrogens, that is plant estrogens, low in phytochemicals that prevent cancer. And uh, paramount, it's also low in chemicals that are accumulated as you go up the food chain. So this is a diet based on starch with fruits and vegetables, which uh, I have clearly recommended for the last 40 years. And uh, is, is uh, discussed in detail in the Starch Solution book and the new book, which will be out September 27th, which we'll have available at the weekend, which begins tomorrow, called The Healthiest Diet on the Planet. And uh, you can also go to the website and see Dr. McDougall's color picture book. There's no ambiguity about what you're to eat. Mm -hmm. You're eating starch, which is rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes. Mary's saying he's talking too fast. Beans, <laughs> peas, and lentils. And you avoid, you avoid animal foods and oils. It's very stupid simple. And uh, Mary's, Mary's published over 3,000 recipes on it. Uh, essentially, everything's free on the website. Right. Okay. But, Very good. Me, Why don't we go ahead and talk about yeah, the let's sugar? Talk a little bit about the sugar thing that's come out and, and a big deal. And I'm gonna see if I can get back to the. Uh, uh, well, here's the here's the paper that came out last week. It's in uh, uh, Internal Medicine, and when I say last week, I mean September 12, 2016. So mm -hmm. let, let me see if I can get back to the slide presentation. Yeah, All right. Uh, Very good. And we have discussed, uh, you have discussed before in other webinars, the topic of thyroid and thyroidism. People are asking about that. But if you go, everybody, if you go to the website and uh, in the webinar page, you will see all the past webinars and they, most of the times they have a title so you can actually find what you're interested in. Okay, and, here we go. And, and use the search engine. And use you know, the search, if, right. If you go to the search engine, you put in hypothyroidism. You'll go to an article I wrote uh, probably in 2005 on treating hypothyroidism. Now, you know, the truth doesn't change. Okay, do you have the Press Democrat headlines from yesterday up? We do. Two days ago? Yeah. All right. This is our front page. Uh, sweet deal for the sugar industry. And uh, what it talks about is how the sugar industry uh, heavily influenced the beliefs on nutrition back in the 1950s and 60s. I, I was... Uh, alive and well then. I became interested in the 70s in that research in the late 70s and a passion since then. And so I'm well aware of all these research articles and not as aware as I should have been about the influence of the sugar industry, which was brought out in this very important article, which you can get for free if you go to a journal of, of internal medicine and you just uh, log into their site. This, this article and a editorial by a, a previous advanced study weekend guest Marion Nessel, extremely important editorial. You can get both of those articles free just by logging into that website. <clears throat> and I encourage you to do it. So a sweet deal for the sugar industry. What they told us is about how the, uh, how the Sugar Research Foundation back in the uh, 50s and 60s and 70s bought researchers from schools as prestigious as Harvard School of Public Health and I knew of these people, I read of their research, Frederick Stair, uh, you know, many, many of the researchers back then, Mark Hegstead, but I knew of these people well, not in person, but I knew about their research because as I said, I read with a passion. So the article was published and uh, uh, this article is, uh, here's, the, here's the front page of the article, which you can read. It talks about how the sugar industry uh, influenced public opinion through the, uh, the, the top-notch, you know, credible medical schools and researchers. And they bought and paid for uh, their opinions. And the opinion that they bought for, just in summary, <clears throat> is that sugar is not as big a problem as uh, it uh, may have been played out to be, particularly by a guy named John Yedkin, whose research I read back then, by the way, and they said uh, the sugar industry wanted us to focus more on vegetable oil, excuse me, saturated fat and cholesterol. 
Those are the terms they ask us to focus on, whereas they didn't really ask them to focus on what saturated fat and cholesterol are, which are meat, dairy, eggs. That's what saturated fat and cholesterol are. So as I've talked to you before, it's all in the terminology, right up into the dietary guidelines for Americans of 2015, 2020 is industry has bought and paid for our guidelines to tell us to avoid saturated fat and cholesterol, which gives us no chance to act. They should say avoid meat, dairy, and eggs. And likewise, they've recommended uh, that we consume polyunsaturated fats, which you know I should strongly recommend against these vegetable oils. Well, anyway, they tried to get uh, these researchers, which it outlines in this article, which is a must read, to focus on cholesterol saturated fat, not meat, dairy, and eggs, mind you, and to give a sugar a relatively free bypass. Uh, Marion's Nestle, she wrote an editorial on this, which, uh, oh, by the way, excuse me, before I get to that, uh, if you go to the uh, Starch Solution book, which I wrote in 2011, you'll find that after you read this article, in JAMA Internal Medicine titled The Sugar Industry and Coronary Heart Disease Research. After you read that in detail, and then you go to page 182 and 183 in my book, The Start Solution, and you read that, just it's right here. You read that one page, oh, well, it's two pages, 182 to 183. You'll find that I said the exact same things that are talked about in this article that was published two days ago, Sugar Industry and Coronary Heart Disease. I said the exact same things about sugar. I talked to you about how simple sugars raise triglycerides, which raise cholesterol, which may increase the risk of heart disease, and how fructose is the worst of all the sugars. I told you that and have in many previous newsletters in the past. My message has been absolutely consistent and right on. And I also told you that starch doesn't do this, which I tell you in this article. Now, you know, my position has always been, and there have been detractors, and I'm so glad that you're giving me more public attention. Fight with me. Don't ignore me. That's the worst you can do to hurt me, is to ignore me. Fight with me. And there are people who have come out and said, well, Dr. McDougall recommends you eat a half a pound of sugar a day on your diet. That is not true. My recommendations have consistently been for my entire 40-year career and are in the book, The Start Solution, published in 2011, and the new book that'll come out September 27th called The Healthiest Diet on the Planet. And everything that I've written on my website, my recommendations have been, you can, if you choose, use a small amount of sugar on the surface of your food. That's adding pleasure to your diet with little cost. A small amount of sugar, what do I talk about? teaspoon of brown sugar on your oatmeal. We've talked about this before, Mary Poppins. A little bit of sugar makes the medicine go down. I will sacrifice for you, and I've written a whole newsletter article about, about for you on this. You can go to Hot Topics and uh, under Carbohydrates and Sugar, you'll find this article about the pleasure of sugar. How I am willing to sacrifice this small insult to your body to trick you into, or to encourage you into, eating the McDougal diet. You know, there's no reason to eat a salt-free or sugar-free diet, in my opinion. When the tip of your tongue tastes with pleasure, salt and sugar, you're designed as salt and sugar seekers. So if I can give you a starch-based meal plan with a tiny bit of salt and sugar on the surface of the food to make your tongue happy, I'm willing to do that. But I have clearly laid out for you on page 182 and 183, if you have the start solution, the exact discussion that appears in this JAM Internal Medicine article. And I didn't leave out a thing. I just said it in three paragraphs or four, three paragraphs. And they took an entire journal article to say it. And I gave you all the references too. So anyway, uh, uh, there's no inconsistency through what I recommend. Uh, the Mary Nestle, she wrote an accompanying editorial. You must read it. And here you compare sugar intake with saturated in fat intake, in other words, animal food intake, 
meat, dairy, and eggs worldwide, you see a straight line correlation. Yes, yes. What I've tried to tell you also is that industry has corrupted you in terms of animal foods. I wrote an article in 2014, that's April 2014 newsletter, about Dr. Lard, who is the head of atherosclerosis of Children's uh, a Hospital in Oakland, who's a, a member of uh, the faculty of UCSF, who's the guy who started all this saturated fat is not harmful for you. I wrote a whole article. You need to read this. And in the process of doing it, go to Google and enter Dr. Dr. Ronald Krauss. Enter his name, Ronald Krauss. And you'll see within the first four returns is my article on Dr. Lard. Now, if I was Dr. Lard, a.k.a. Ronald Krauss, I would have my attorneys on Dr. McDougall's doorstep for writing such a defaming, unfortunately true for him, article about how he corrupted the science. Go ahead, do it now or do it when we get off. Go to Google Ronald Krauss and my newsletter will be, it's been between number one and number four over the last two weeks I've been checking it. And it's been that way for two years and it will be that way for the next 10 years. This is the man who made lard eating fashionable. And by the way, we have a new Dr. Lard of the United Kingdom, Asin Mahaltra. He's getting lots of press. Another Dr. Lard. Doesn't change the facts. Okay, I've tried to give you more of how industry corrupts. I've written for you about how uh, Wheat Billy and Grain Brain have lied to you and told you how they lied. In fact, that's the third chapter in the new book, uh, The Healthiest Diet on the Planet. I've talked to you about how the egg industry has corrupted the U.S. dietary guidelines so that they've taken the limits off cholesterol and how myself along with PCRM have filed a lawsuit against the egg industry. I've told you this. I've written newsletters, I've written newsletters about it. I've told you about how the dietary guidelines are basically dominated by agribusiness and how they've lied to you. I've shown you how they've done it, where they've done it, the mechanisms, the research. I told you all this. Ugh. Anyway. The bottom line is this. Let me just give you the end discussion. Is my message has always been that rich foods make people sick. They have since the pharaohs of 4,000 years ago. They have with the kings and queens of Europe. Rich foods make you sick. It's just that today we have billions of people who can afford to eat the rich Western diet because of the industrial revolution and because of fossil fuels. So what are rich foods? Well, they're animal foods and oils and cakes and cookies and sugars. And, you know, that's been my message all along. It hasn't been just don't eat meat or cheese or vegetable oil. Those are the dominant problems. Believe me, they are far, far more of a burden on your body than a simple sugar, which is not health food. Rots your teeth, raises triglycerides, is a factor in coronary artery disease. I have told you this. But my uh, recommendation and my message to you is very simple, very undeniable. If you eat like a king and a queen, you will look and feel like a king and a queen. Well, boy, oh boy, I hope those slides came out okay there, Gustavo. Yes, we can actually see it, yeah. And, and Dr. McDougall, I have here just to, um, let's see, to briefly show people because some, some of them are asking, how when we go to, oh, well, I don't have it right now. I thought I did. Uh, they can go to your website, drmartulo.com, and click on the um, search. Uh, you can do that. Or you can go to Hot Topics uh, or you can go to search right. and enter Ron across there. But I want you to go to Google and enter his name. <laughs> uh, yeah, these, well, these, these, these people need to be exposed. They do. But they're, they're afraid to come out. You know, the stage is there. I'm welcome to meet them. The stage is there, but, you know, they just kind of, as you will find by reading the two CVs I did of Ronald Krauss, he works for the dairy and the cattle industry. Right. And uh, his research uh, focus has changed from plant food based to help people to, to the fact that he believes that eating animals is of no harm. This is crooked corruption, just mm -hmm. like the sugar industry article that was published here. Just don't stop with sugar. Sugar is a... Um, uh, a, a minor player, and they've certainly got kicked in the teeth <clears throat> over the last four years, deservedly so. 
but the, but the, the people against the sugar industry, like Robert Lustig, Andrew Weil, you know, uh, William Davis, uh, David Perlmutter, Sally Fallon, mm -hmm. you know, all these low carbers, uh, in addition to them being unhealthy looking themselves, except for David Perlmutter, uh, these people have fought the sugar industry and missed the elephant in the room and their personal appearance shows. They missed the element elephant in the room, which is uh, the animal foods, the, the livestock industry, the fish, the dairy, the meat. You know, they're not only destroying people's health, they're destroying the environment. And it's, uh, it's, it, it, it is possibly too late. But I can't get up in the morning and say to myself, it's too late for my grandkids. And neither should you. You should get no. up in the morning. And you should say, "We can beat these. You can beat these liars." And this is one big step. And Mary Nestle's editorial is another big step. Read it. She tells you about the meat, the dairy industry. She knows about them. I know about them. Right. It doesn't stop there. It's the pharmaceutical industry. It's it's just money. It's just money, ladies and gentlemen. And your family, you, your community, our country, the planet needs better than just to make big bucks for these industries. They're liars. They need to be outed. I can't do it alone. There is help out there. You know, many of my good friends, Garth Davis, Neil Bernard, Dean Arnish, who, by the way, will be at the Advanced Study Weekend this uh, this uh, on Sunday this week. And all the young doctors that we're going to present this weekend at the Advanced Study Weekend, who you can watch on the internet, I mean, we have an army. It's just uh, that it's not well funded. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. But compared to what it was like, let's just just ten years ago, it has. Uh, I mean, a lot has. I think the army has grown and become stronger. Well, you told me you got a new iPhone. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, you know, anybody. The thing is, is everybody and anybody can have access to the truth. They just need to take 10 minutes out of right. the day and ask the questions. And I encourage you to start with what I've written and then take what I've written and try and tear it to pieces. Well, I welcome, I welcome the controversy. I, I plead for the stage. Uh, my uh, belief for 40 years is they're gonna wait till I get too old and feeble to fight them. Hey, it hasn't happened yet, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> no, you know, I'm I'm still I'm still able to stand on stage and give you my more than two cents. I won't hesitate. I'm not there to win a popularity contest. It's not that I have no fear. It's just that I have great love uh, for the truth. Right, and we look forward to seeing you on the stage this weekend. <laughs> That's I, I, sure. I, I'm, I'm excited. We start tomorrow at five and. And you can watch it. You can watch it worldwide on the internet. Share with right. your friends and family. It's a uh, it's it's a cheap price for a great weekend. And it's and isn't it, isn't it isn't it available for uh, a while later as well? It's not just live, right? No, it's not just live. It's available for six months uh, because mm -hmm. of uh, uh, individual uh, property rights. You know, I, I can't I can't uh, take my speakers' uh, intellectual right. properties. So uh, we make it available for six months. We have some amazing speakers, and you can look at the website and see who they are. Never to be repeated again. That's the thing about these advanced study weekends. We start, and I say, I'll say tomorrow at five. I don't know how this is going to turn out. Unfortunately, on Sunday at four o'clock, or three, or four, the audience and I agree this is the best advanced study weekend we've ever done. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know. It's it's probably true, but uh, the the previous ones are the best too. Oh, I know. Yes. Oh, and I have something very serious to to uh, to show you. And this is not any any shallow stuff here. I I found something that I'm going to that I couldn't resist because it's of the flamingo. Look at the socks. Oh, yeah, okay. so, <laughs> that's the resort we're at. So I'm going to wear flamingo socks. <laughs> <laughs> to the flamingo. Well, you you, you got to wear shorts along with it, or people won't see them. <laughs> anyway, I thought it was funny. Yeah, fortunately or unfortunately, it's really hot in California right now. 
<laughs> right, it is. Well, it's hot here in Texas. Well, thank you, Dr. McDougall. We will see you in person tomorrow or uh, this weekend, or we'll see you in our next webinar next week. That'll be great. I, I believe that I'm on stage next week. I, I certainly look forward to spending time with you. And, yeah, uh, yes, that'll thanks, be fine. Thanks for your patience, and uh, thanks for all your help, Gustavo. Uh, without you, a year and a half ago, I've said this before, and it deserves repeating over and over again, without your inspiration to do these webinars, uh, I would have never had the opportunity, and hopefully those of you listening consider it an opportunity and uh, offer your gratitude, as I do to Gustavo. For well, thank you. I appreciate it. And I, it's very rewarding to see how many people, you know, how many lives you have touched, and I've had that little, uh, I've done something as well. Everybody enjoys it. Well, next week we'll take another stab at the uh, at the at the second opinion yes. book. Very good. All but all but not outdated. Yes, <laughs> and make sure you all do the homework because here we're in a classroom environment, right? Yeah. We have a uh, great Dr. McDougall. Thank you again, and we'll see you in about. Well, I'll see you soon, but we'll see you next week online. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great weekend.